Mary is this? It says Myla here. Myla? I don't know her. I've got your diary. This magic diary is amazing. Welcome to the third day of Teacher Cleaning Days, organized by ELT News. I'm Mr. Matis Papadimitriou, a teacher and language school owner from Athens. Today's topic is teaching grammar in a non-conventional way. Uh, now, this is a brilliant topic, wouldn't you say so? I think the way teachers approach grammar is a clear indication of their general philosophy about language teaching and language learning. Let's see what our presenters have to say about all this. Three presenters are with us today. Uh, Maria Davu, uh, teacher, uh, teacher trainer and language school owner from Athens. Uh, Rachel Paley, neuroscientist, uh, who will be joining us from Spain. Um, uh, George Cocolas, general manager at uh, Express Publishing from Athens. Andrew Watley, uh, teacher trainer uh, and author from London. In between, we have three very informative presentations from our sponsors, Andrew Betsy's, Burlington Books and Oxford University Press. Don't miss them. ELT News would like to extend its warmest thanks to all our sponsors who made the Teacher Clinic Day happen. Maria Davo, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Teaching Grammar Without Teaching Grammar talk for ELT, uh, ELT News uh, amazing event. Thank you for inviting me uh, one more time. And always thank you, teachers. You know, this is the hashtag I've been using since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, as I think, teachers are also heroes. And I suggest we all use it to remind people that what we've been doing these days is really difficult. So, you know, this is this without is my favorite word. I like to do things without doing things. Uh, and I will start with a very short excerpt from a video from a movie all educators love. Uh, let me take it. five weeks. The first 20 questions at the end of chapter one are due tomorrow. Agricola, 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 Okay, and if this sounds terribly boring, outdated, and terrible. Think about how much we've been doing it when we ask our students to conjugate verbs. Okay, so let me start by stating what we're not going to do today. Unlike other presentations, I like to talk about things we're not going to do. So the first thing we're not going to do is we're not going to play grammar games. Uh, and we're not going to personify grammar. I'm not going to talk about Miss Present Perfect who got married to Mr. Past Simple and they gave birth to little gerund and little infinitive. Um, this is a tendency in the ELT market in Greece uh, that I seriously dislike. I do not like to personify grammar. Um, and we're not going to talk about grammar books or grammar-based syllabi. And we're not going to do this. And I want you to reflect on how much we've been doing this kind of drilling, uh, which is like the conjugation of the verb uh, in the Dead Poet Society uh, clip. Mm, you know, we have students do things 
which do not actually inspire them and uh, in which they're not actually engaged or even involved. Uh, things like this. My brother is in the garden. Mon frère est dans le jardin. Répétez. My brother is in the garden. Where is the bicycle? Où est la bicyclette? Répétez. Where is the bicycle? So the idea is that we ask our students to do things that are empty of meaning, that are mechanical. And this is basically how we've been teaching grammar in Greece for at least uh, the history of all time now, the, the, the history of centuries in English language teaching. So now let's see what we are going to do today. We're going to look at, at language as a whole. We're going to adopt a, a holistic approach to language teaching. I want to raise your awareness on how not to focus on grammar. Um, to understand how language learning works. And actually, because this is the big argument usually coming from teachers, but it's in the test. I want us to reflect a little bit on the language that is actually tested. Um, by the way, if you have questions, you can send them in the Q&A box and I will address uh, as, as many as possible towards the end of this talk. So before everything, I want you to think of a metaphor. What is language like? If you want, you can share your metaphor in the chat box. Language, is it like a river? Is it like a tree? Is it like a train? Is it like the rain? Is it whatever comes to mind? Be as poetic as you want. What is language like? I would like to see some, some uh, answers in the chat box. We have, uh, Vicky says, uh, language is like a journey, like a living organism from Elisabeth. Thank you. Uh, flowing down my throat. It's like a breath, a river. Okay, we've got lots of answers. Thank you very much. A jungle. I like that one because we can, you know, we can walk through it. But if you're hungry, it's early in the morning. I'm sure you've had your breakfast yet. For me, language is like pizza. And why? I want you to think of the pizza ingredients, you know, the pizza dough, the mozzarella cheese, the, the, uh, the, the tomatoes, the peppers, whatever. And if you have them separately, you don't have your pizza. You need to put them all together uh, to, and have them melt together and become one thing to have a pizza. Exactly the same with language. Unless you have the whole thing, meaning grammar, vocabulary, phonology, discourse, um, and the four skills together, it's not language. It's just pizza dough or mozzarella cheese. So if you ask me for a pizza and I bring you the different ingredients and I say, eat them, you will look at me as if I'm an alien. Think of our students. We say, no, it's grammar time. Well, grammar time is like mozzarella time, not like pizza time. So this is just to point out that I want us to look at language as a whole. And if you want to remember one thing from today's talk, remember pizza. Um, now, I want to start with a personal confession. I used to be a grammar freak and I used to teach in the way I now totally dislike. Um, you know, 30 years ago when I started teaching, uh, you know, I had this grammar day, uh, two hours a week where my students would have a separate grammar notebook. We would write down the rules, okay, in English with examples, we would conjugate verbs, we would do all the things I now despise. And I realized that this was crazy when I went to the States to do my master's and nobody else in the world was teaching grammar like I was teaching grammar. And I thought, hmm, there's something wrong here. So here are some things we've generally been doing. Um, I want you to very quickly go through them. And in the chat box, tell me with how many of these you agree. Just a number, like I agree with four, I agree with six, I agree with two. Just a number of how many of these statements you agree with. Thank you for this, Efrosini. Hi, Penny. Okay, we've got one, three, none, Dimitra, five from others, four. Okay. Uh, okay, people agree with um, a number of these statements. Normally, if you look at second language acquisition research, and if you look at 
experience as well, uh, we should disagree with all. You know, look at number six. My best students are grammar experts. My best students are not grammar experts at all. They're YouTubers or gamers or people obsessed with music and songs and films and series. Um, I would like you to take a look at number four. If you know good grammar, you can get your message across more easily. In fact, if you know good vocabulary, you can get your message across more easily. And number five about major communication breakdowns, they can happen uh, not because of, of grammar errors. They usually happen in spoken language because of phonology, in written language because of spelling mainly. So, you know, have you ever seen anybody traveling carrying a grammar book? We need words to communicate. And words have grammar inside them. There is no such thing as a word that has no grammar. It's a part of a speech and it has a certain morphology. So words carry grammar. Now, I'm going to tell you another true story. When I was doing my master's in the States, um, I had this fellow student. She was a, a very nice girl from Greek. Greece, and we had a professor of um, phonology and phonetics. And, you know, at the end of our class, she goes to him and she says, Professor, do you want the kiss? And, you know, I thought, what is she talking about? I mean, is she hitting on him or something? And, you know, um, she kept asking, Professor, do you want the kiss? Do you want the kiss? And, our professor, a very nice man, was kind of perplexed because, you know, do I want the kiss? Don't I want the kiss? Um, of course, what did she mean? Can you think? She was asking about the keys. She had the keys of the phonology lab. So she wanted to say, do you want the keys? Her English was perfect otherwise, but just to point out that major communication breakdowns, as I said before, happen because of pronunciation errors, because of phonology. And in written language, mailing, ma mainly due to spelling and then punctuation and then word order. Now, just think about how much time do you spend teaching the tenses, teaching causative form, and how much time do you spend teaching pronunciation, teaching spelling and punctuation? Hmm? Now, the questions we're going to ask ourselves today is, is the grammar we teach authentic? Is the grammar we test authentic? And is the grammar in major exams the grammar we teach? The answer to all three questions is a big no. And we will see why. This is grammar from a grammar uh, section of a very, very popular high stakes international exam. And if you look at the two random items here, um, there's no grammar. I mean, Everything is grammar, but really, how can you teach them? There, is there any rule? No, because what major exams uh, have include is not the traditional grammar we've been teaching. It's what we call lexicalized grammar or grammaticalized lexis. There are two terms that we can use interchangeably. And it's all about things that go together, chunks, collocations. So focus on these. English is a highly collocated language, and it's, it's important to teach words not in isolation. This has all the grammar our students need inside it. Now, remember that uh, grammar should not be taught through artificial rules because the English language for a, a series of historical and geographical reasons is not rule-based. Hmm? So we, we, we teachers have created a set of artificial rules that then when they reach C1 or C2, our students, we just break them. We tell them, forget about it. Think of this always that we teach as a frequency adverb for present simple. Oh my God, I always thought this is not right. Okay, now we could go back to, to education now and not to English language teaching in particular. How do we learn better? John Dewey, uh, an American philosopher, educationist, um, and, and you know, a, a very important person in the history of education. Um, we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflective, reflecting on experience. This, in other words, is called metacognition. Mm -hmm. So historically, people at the beginning of history were learning by doing things through their experience. Then with formal education, they started learning by studying things. And nowadays we know through neuroscience that we learn better when we do things, experiential learning, 
And then we go back and we reflect on what we did. And this is metacognitive learning. This is exactly what information we will learn from, again, neuroscience findings and what we call the brain-based learning framework, which has these principles hmm, that uh, we learn in collaboration with others. We, don't, we do not learn better in isolation, that learning needs experience and thought, and that we teachers, this is my favorite, should be experienced orchestrators. Uh, and of course, that emotions are very important. We need to feel safe to learn. We need to have fun to learn. Hmm? And I mean, basically, this concept of experience orchestrating uh, was, was uh, e expressed way before neuroscience findings were here. I never teach my pupils. I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn. Think about it. So the first point was, do not teach through artificial rules, but let's teach by doing things and then reflecting what we did. Now, very quick question. I don't know if you know what bloodletting it is. It was a, a very common medical practice in the 19th century, very painful. Um, it was used to cure all diseases, but many people were dying because of it. So instead of a, of a cure, it was actually a curse. Um, and we don't use it anymore, of course, because it's outdated, because, the, because medicine has improved, as have uh, all other sciences, in fact, engineering, uh, you know, biology, everything. How much has our teaching of English changed, though? Um, look at that. I mean, there's, there are these Facebook groups and, you know, they're full of questions that have to do with specific grammar points that teachers freak out about and, you know, details here and there. That, that then there, there are 100 comments of people discussing if it should be past continuous or past simple or this or that and the keywords. And if teachers need 100 different people uh, debating about something, which is interesting in terms of applied linguistics and theoretical linguistics, but it's not interesting for our students. Just skip it. So if you think about how much education has changed, unlike medicine, unlike biology, it hasn't changed much. Okay, yes, we have colors. Yes, we have interactive whiteboards, but the majority of our classes are still teacher-led and teacher-centered, and they're not very experiential. And if you think, I mean, I'm not talking about things like that. There are very well-meant colleagues that try to make grammar teaching more creative. And what they basically do is they, they use, you know, a lot of uh, surrounding resources to teach in exactly the same way as they used to teach in the past. So you're still conjugating the verb, right? So you haven't changed your, your grammar teaching. You're just making it more flashy. That's not what I'm talking about today. So enough with theory. That was a little bit of painting the background of grammar teaching. And let's see. I'm going to ask you to do a task. I want you to imagine that you have uh, an A2 plus class, B CFR level, and you want to teach one of these grammar points. So the first thing I want you to do is take a breath and decide today I'm going to teach and choose one of the four. You don't have to tell me which one, just because I'm going to ask you to do something with it. Just choose one of the four. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming you've chosen one and I'm going to give you the task in a minute. No, there's no task. You got pranked. Why? Because these grammar points are a waste of time. You don't need to spend time teaching them. Why? Because will versus going to, there's no difference. I know people tell me, yes, but it's in the book. Skip it. Yes, but it's in the test. No, it's not. It's in the practice test you've been using but it's not in the real test because this dis difference has stopped existing in corpus linguistics analysis for at least 25 years now so you won't find it in any test so skip it uh, there is one difference that you can teach later on and especially when it comes to uh, formal writing essays and so on that will is more formal and going to is more, more informal other than that this example with the clouds how gray they are and if you're certain it's going to rain if you're not certain um, uh, it will rain and i mean this doesn't make any sense skip it instead play games have fun 
uh, experiments, whatever you want with your students. Stated verbs, uh, see, this is an old movie. I'm understanding what I'm reading. And if you watch Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, uh, you will see that in all series, stated verbs are being used in very non-stative ways. Skip them or expose them to their, to, to their correct, let's say, use and forget about the rule. And these are examples from Cambridge Dictionary or Penny Eyre, a famous linguist. And Leo Sullivan, one of my favorite linguists, uh, also believes, and this is from Aya Teffel in, in Brighton, I think, um, his talk that, I mean, we, it's time not well spent. Uh, the same goes for uh, other grammar points like less and few, because, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've, had, you've heard Obama's talk where he says less people. So, yeah. I mean, in the old grammar rule, less people is wrong, but mm, do we know better than Obama, the most educated president in the history of the United States? So the question is, how can we teach grammar and can we teach grammar? And the answer is, yes, we can, don't worry, we can teach grammar, but we can teach grammar without teaching grammar. Um, so everything we teach has grammar in it. This is why I love grammar. Let me remind you, I'm a grammar freak. I read grammar in my free time, and I think teachers should know perfect grammar because this is one of the reasons we chose this this job like a chef needs to know which mozzarella cheese is the best for his pizza but this does not mean that this is how we need we should be teaching so let's just teach the language uh, so this is the basic rules of teaching grammar without teaching grammar have a look at them what i want you to focus on is the rule of economy Economize on presentation, maximize on practice. Can you guess the maximum time we can spend on teaching, on, on presenting grammar points? The maximum. So if we want our students to be with us, can you guess how many minutes? Thank you, Nicole. It's five minutes, five minute maximum, uh, minutes maximum. After that, our learners will be thinking of, you know, video games, their boyfriend or girlfriend, this fly on the wall, but they won't be thinking of what we're saying. So five minutes maximum. And ideally, you organize the experience first, you spend five minutes on presentation. If necessary, you go on with practice, which should be fun and experiential as well. So let's see practically ways in which we can teach grammar through different channels, uh, which, is, which is not the traditional teaching, explicit teaching of grammar. And let's see some examples from the classroom. Now, this is an exercise you, I mean, in fact, I want you to close your eyes. I'm not gonna show it. I want you to close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes, don't fall asleep, just close your eyes. And I want you to think of a person you really love. And I want you to think of what this person is doing right now. Are they sleeping? Are they having breakfast? Are they working? Are they listening to you, uh, you know, and my presentation along? Just think of this person you really love and what they're doing right now. Now, open your eyes. Normally, I would ask you to share with a partner. Uh, who did you think of and what is this person doing right now? And what is this? This is a present continuous exercise. And this is how I introduce present continuous. Or you can tell your students, you know, now that we're doing uh, online classes, look outside the window and tell me what you can see. And what is this person doing right now? Or what is this dog doing right now? Or what is this car doing right now? And this is another uh, one of my favorite exercises on, on present continuous, continuous. It comes from Oxford Discover. I mean, look at how present continuous is presented through knowledge of vocabulary, content, and visual literacy. So really, you need to understand everything to be able to do this exercise, which seems very easy, but in fact, it involves all cognitive skills here. Mm? This is a holistic grammar, a grammar exercise, teaching grammar without teaching grammar. The whole idea, therefore, is to teach lexically, to, to focus on the word and its surroundings, on the chunks. And the grammar, these chunks carry in them. 
so my favorite way of teaching nowadays, and it has become a very favorite way of teaching for lots of teachers is through narratives and through storytelling. So, uh, and through creative writing, uh, meaningful communication in English, even very short phrases for very young learners uh, can promote uh, and, and speed up English language acquisition. And uh, these should be personalized. They should be really creative, like have them write poems, have them write songs, have them write crazy stories. Um, and all this carries a lot of meaning. Uh, it's very motivating and it's full of grammar. You can teach grammar through CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning. And this is an exercise I use with my B Junior class. Uh, but you can use it with any class of young learners. Um, it's an example of CLIL and grammar teaching. The, the question is, does it sink or does it float? So I ask my, my learners to bring different objects. And basically the, the whole discussion is gravity, about gravity. Hmm? Do objects sink or float? And we predict. So I ask, guys, does it sink or does it float? And they say, it sinks, it floats, you know, they predict. And then we see what happens. And then we also might say, uh, no, it doesn't sink, or no, it doesn't float. And of course, all of this is to teach. Um, third, uh, present simple third person, uh, affirmative, interrogative, negative, in a way they will never forget. And in fact, even our test at the end of the month or the unit is with examples from this exercise, there is a great video on YouTube with a lady doing it with, um, I think, first graders, the exact same experiment, and you can use it for your test. Uh, and of course, we, 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 we can teach grammar through arts and crafts. Be careful, though, because there's a lot of craftivities uh, going uh, on around us. Uh, we are language teachers, language educators, if you want, and we're not art teachers. So every time we create uh, a craft with our learners, it needs to have a language focus. Because when we talk about experiential learning, it does not mean it's easy. So take a piece of paper, draw something, give it to me. Great. Thank you very much. No, it, it, it needs a lot of thought before, a lot of structure during, and a lot of expectation at the end. What is your learning objective and your learning outcome for doing this creativity with your learners? Because if it's just art, then you, can, you, you may as well change job. You're not a language teacher, you're an art teacher. Uh, favorite way, as I said, narratives and especially fairy tales. Now, if you want to teach grammar through a fairy tale, a specific gram grammar point, I mean, make sure you choose one they already know, maybe one you've worked with uh, already in class, uh, like the Gruffalo, for example, we've been reading it for a month, doing different activities on it, um, or we're going on a bear hunt, or one they already know from Greek, like Little Red Riding Hood, or the Three Little Pigs, or the Three Little Hooves. Uh, you can find it in English, by the way, it's a Greek um, children's book, but you can find it in, in Greek, in English as well. Um, and then you give them, for example, this is an excerpt from uh, Little Red Riding Hood, how can you use it to teach grammar? So if you look at this excerpt, I mean, there's all kinds of grammar points you can teach through it from uh, past verbs, uh, adjectives, uh, prepositions, articles, um, possessive adjectives, um, you know, anything i mean it's, it's discourse uh, linkers whatever you want subordinate clauses so what i normally do when i use a story to teach grammar is first i read the story and i read it with visuals or you know i i i use a lot of uh, vocal variation and gestures and body language we might watch a video with a story then uh, I give them paragraphs of the story in the wrong order and I ask them to put them in the right order. And this in reality makes them um, be more exposed to the story, read it, and they also learn discourse, the, the coherence and cohesion. Then I will move on with comprehension questions about the story, reading comprehension on, or listening comprehensions. See, so far, I've done nothing that explicitly teaches grammar. We've just been reading the story and doing things with the story and understanding the story. You know, true, false questions, multiple choice questions, open-ended questions, vocabulary questions. And then I would give them a part of the story with gaps and ask them to fill them out. 
uh, sorry, I, want, I need to go to back to my previous slide. So depending on what you want to focus on, let's say you want to focus on verbs in the past. So I would take out all the verbs in the past and I would ask them to fill them in. And you can give, you can create a multiple choice exercise again, or, uh, you know, a, an open clause exercise, or you can give them the verbs in a box uh, in, in infinitive and ask them to find where they go and, and, uh, and transform them into past tense and everything. But really, this will be kind of easy because they've already been exposed to the story. They've listened to it. They've played with it. They have reorganized it. They have, you know, answered questions about it. So the grammar will come in a very automatic way. And this is what we want. And if you want to know the reason why exams, some exams give very limited time uh, for, for candidates to complete them is because what we need to test is this inner uh, knowledge of grammar and not the rule. So, you know, just does it come quickly? Hmm? Um, okay, and of course we can teach grammar through role plays. You know, you can give them something to memorize. You can then bring objects and ask them to do it. This is a how much, how many exercise. Very, very simple. Uh, we can teach grammar, one of the best ways through project-based learning, have students work through a project for a month. Uh, there is a lot of language ne negotiation there and meaning negotiation and lots of grammar. Uh, and then, you know, always have a final presentation because for the final presentation, they will need to go over it and self-correct and check, is this right or is this wrong? Um, you can teach grammar through songs. There is a traditional way of picking a song that has the grammar point or songs that focus on meaning like stories and from which you can extract the grammar point. And of course, my favorite way, as I said again and again, is through stories. And I'm gonna tell you a story now, but while I'm telling the story, I will be asking you to answer some questions. So what I want you to do is have pen and paper in front of you because you have to write down the answers to, to my questions. So I hope you like stories. I always have a little bit of background music when I tell stories. Okay, are we ready? So the story is called The Man and the Chest. Once upon a time, and it's a true story by the way, there was a man who lived in a far away country and he had a very Norman life and he was a very lonely man. So every day he would wake up, he would go to work, he would have lunch, he would read a book, watch TV, go to bed same day, day after day. He had no friends or relatives. And remember, it's a true story and it's sad. One day, our man got a notice from the post office. The sender was anonymous. So, you know, that was kind of exciting for his uh, routinary life. He went to the post office and what he was given was uh, a wooden chest like this one the size but it was locked sender anonymous uh, chest locked question and please write down the answer what would you do if you received the box the chest and i want you to answer this way if i received the box i would okay My second question is, how would you feel if you were the man? And I want you to answer this way. If I were the man, I would feel... Sure you've given several answers so our man uh, felt scared felt curious felt excited he took the wooden box uh, back home and he didn't know what to do with it 
So he thought of going to the police, he thought of opening it, he thought of throwing it uh, away. Remember, it's a true story, but he didn't know what to do with it. So um, a, a, a week went by, a month went by, a whole year went by, and he still hadn't opened the box. After exactly one year, um, the man got a second notice from the post office on exactly the same day, one year after. It's a true story. And he went to the post office again, handshaking. This time, again, the center was anonymous. But this time, the box, the wooden box, was small like this. And it was not locked. Inside it was the key. So now I want you to answer this question. What would you do if you got the key? Please make sure you use the structure. If I got the key, I would. So I'm assuming most of you uh, would open the box finally or would find it very strange and go to the police. Uh, our man got the key, went home, his hands were shaking. He went near the lock. He thought, oh my God, I'm going to open it and find out what is in there after all this time. But he said, no, I cannot do it today. I'll do it tomorrow. I'm too stressed. It's a true story, remember, and it's been 15 years since it happened and the man hasn't opened the box yet. So the next questions are, what do you think is inside the box and why wouldn't the man open it? And I have a discussion with my students, which is kind of interesting. And, you know, I see students after many years and they still ask me, you know, did he open the box after all? So, but basically this is my way, the story is my way of teaching, introducing the second condition. I don't talk about it. Uh, it's very guided. Um, it's very implicit and it's teaching grammar without teaching grammar. Now, uh, James Purpura from the University of Columbia at um, a summer school in Siena on, on language assessment told us that this kind of grammar quizzes are okay. 10 item multiple choice, always a context, always a theme. We give it to our students before we teach the unit, the topic, uh, including the grammar point, and we give the same test after a month after we have finished teaching and we see if we made a difference. Now, when is it okay to teach grammar explicitly? Explicitly, if you have a writing class focusing on accuracy, if you do English for academic purposes and academic writing, if you are above B2, which is, you know, through writing, we do language analysis, but they're cognitively ready for that age-wise. Uh, if you have advanced adult learners, because for some reason, they, this is the only way they can learn because this is what their experience has taught them. If you have a specialized course or in cases of fossilization, if after, you know, six months of saying, uh, oh, you went to the party and the student says goat, then it means this might be fossilized and we need to intervene and offer metalinguistic feedback. Uh, remember, we need to teach as active experience orchestrators and not as grammar boxes uh, or grammar robots. And remember, we can learn grammar without being taught grammar. This is how, you know, bilinguals learn the language or people who are immersed in, in a linguistic environment learn the language. Um, and most importantly, let's not teach grammar without teaching the language, because I see a lot of students know, knowing everything about the language and not knowing the language. In fact, I even see teachers like that, which is sad. So this is teaching grammar without teaching grammar. Stay tuned because uh, a resource book is coming out soon, uh, teaching grammar without teaching grammar. And thank you very much.